Hi students, we're going to start a new region today. Uh, it's called megalopolis and that is kind of a funny interesting word megalopolis. Um, what it is, it uh, came about from a French geographer named Jean Gottman and what he was seeing was this huge population stretching from about Washington DC all the way up to Boston and it wasn't like one big city but it's it's like a many centered region okay but it's still it's so largely populated that it feels like when you're driving from one city to the next you can't tell where one ends and one begins so he came up with this term megalopolis <clears throat> um if we are looking though at this area like i said it's a many centered region think of the cities that we're talking about in here we're talking about washington dc and baltimore and even Philadelphia and New York City and on up to Boston. These are all big cities. They're, um, they have their own influence, their own personality. Uh, so they don't wanna be thought of as just one major city. They're also different. That's why we call it a many centered region, okay? So as we're looking at this area, let's look at the physical geography first. Here's a map of the area. These are the states that are involved in the megalopolis region. And hopefully you can see, look at the coastline. There are a lot of peninsulas, a lot of islands, a lot of coastline, a lot of harbors, bays, estuaries, a lot of deep harbors, which is so good for ships coming in. So lots of benefit to having this kind of uh, coastline. But remember, this is also part of the coastal plain. So we know it's a gentle sloping, fairly flat area which is prone to flooding. A lot of rivers coming down through this area and uh, they get quite a bit of rainfall in the area. And so we get, you know, a lot of potential for flooding. Also hurricanes can come up into this area. So, you know, they get some pretty extreme weather from time to time. All right, when we're also looking at this, I want you to think of those two terms, site and situation. Site being the physical landscape. So we've got mountains over here on uh, the western side of the region and a lot of coastline over here on the eastern side. Okay, so that would deal with site, of course, and situation is its relative location. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. <clears throat> All right, so the physiographic regions in the area would be uh, the coastal plain. You know, we just talked about how the coast is fairly flat and uh, all of that prone to flooding and rivers, okay? The Appalachian Mountains, we've talked about those a little bit being not very tall. Uh, up in this Northern area, let me go back to this. Up in this Northern area, the Appalachian Mountains have had glaciers come down all the way down into this area. So remember when we talked about glaciers back in chapter two and the, what they create, they create, create uh, U-shaped valleys and they, um, create fjords where they um, melt away and that water fills in and it's called a drowned valley, that's fjords. Uh, it also creates moraines, remember, like when glaciers are pushing forward, like a big bulldozer, they leave all that debris, <laughs> rock soils, tree trunks, anything, push it out of the way. And then as it melts back, it has left this great big pile. Well, those piles can be huge. In fact, Long Island right here was a moraine, okay? All right, so you've got glaciated mountains up here that are not very tall, and you've got the coastal plain down here, and right in between the two is what's called the Piedmont. And the Piedmont is actually the farthest portion of the Appalachian Mountains from the east, and where the Piedmont butts into the coastal plain, like that, right along here is called the fall line, okay? So here are the Appalachian Mountains, here's the flat coastal plain, and right where they meet is called the fall line. So this red line right here on this map, that's the fall line. What does that mean? It's very significant. It's because, do you see how deep these are, these big harbors right in through here? They're very deep, like I said, so ships can come all the way in, and unload passengers or any kind of goods, products, whatever. And as they unload, they need people there to help them unload. So this drew a lot of people to the area for jobs. 
And as they came here for jobs, then they needed housing, they needed uh, supplies, they needed groceries, they needed all kinds of things, right? So little settlements grew in these areas, becoming towns, and these towns have grown into what are called fall line cities. They're cities that develop right along the fall line. And look at these big cities, Washington DC, Baltimore, um, New York City, okay, Philadelphia. Those are all along the fall line. Okay, so the fall line is very significant in that way. All right, so lots of rivers in the area. I just talked about how it's glaciated up in the northern end. Weather and climate in this area, they can get some pretty extreme things. It's considered a capital C and a capital D. Do you remember what those are? We've got mild mid-latitude and severe mid-latitude, okay? They're both mid-latitude, that's understandable. But why is one mild and one uh, more severe? Where would you think you'd find the milder weather? Along the coast, right? Along the coast. So when you're looking back at this map, along the coast, it's gonna be milder weather than it is up in elevation up here. Remember, they're gonna get some more easterly winds flowing into this area. So that's gonna cause some weather issues. All right, and then, um, Okay, let's let's go on. Oops, sorry. So know where these are. The more severe mid-latitude, remember severe, if you got a D in your report card, that was severe. All right, so D for severe. That's going to be more inland, away from the coast. All right. Those estuaries I was showing you, estuary is where rivers, which are freshwater, mix with seawater, which is salty water, and uh, they form kind of an interesting habitat there, uh, brackish waters, and sometimes it's, it's filled in with water, sometimes it's very dry. So the plants in the area are very specific, okay? All right, some different types of soils. It's not really thought of as a, a huge agricultural market in this area. It's much more thought of as a highly urbanized, um, a lot of businesses, you know, just a lot going on. And think, picture New York City. All right, let's go on up. See, I already got ahead of myself with the fall line, but here's another map of it, okay? And this will give you some reading to do on the fall line. Let's talk a bit about relative location. And um, think about relative location. Remember we said that's the same as situation. We're just going to use this map again. Okay, so think of where we are. We're on the far east coast of the United States. We're the closest place to Europe, right, from the United States. That's very important because remember our immigrants came into this area. A lot of our immigrants and waves and waves of our immigrants, in fact, came in, um, you know, through this area and in fact settled in this area and lots of different ethnic enclaves in this area. And that's one of the major reasons it got so populated because people came over and they stayed. So we had to get clever and get some incentives going to pe get people to move over the Appalachian Mountains towards the West. All right. Also, we have good routes to the interior here. There are a lot of uh, connections uh, for trade going to the rest of the United States. So that's important as well. Uh, this is just showing you how populated the cities have become. Okay, and starting off real early, you could see, you know, waves of immigrants coming in and then growing tremendously. Okay. All right, that's just some pretty pictures of the area. I don't know if any of you have been to New York in the harbor there, if you've been to Ellis Island. Uh, this is just looking at a population graph and seeing how highly or how densely populated the area is in these big cities. Looking today, I'm not giving you necessarily the population today, but I'm giving you kind of the percentages. So in this area, you have close to 20% of the total US population living in this area. You only have under 2% of the total land area. That sounds like it's gonna be crowded, right? People on top of each other almost. And then this talks about, you know, export and so on. So it is truly a re region of significance 
um, think about what is here, New York City. Um, think about Washington, D.C., federal government. Think of the power, think of the wealth, all of that. Um, not just the federal government in this area, but financial services, Broadway, Wall Street, banks, insurance companies, corporate executives in this area. A lot of top museums are here. Think of the advertising agencies along Madison Avenue, for instance. These are the agencies that create logos and slogans and brands and symbols that are recognized around the world. That's how significant these things are. The buildings are even icons here. Okay, and of course the skyscrapers here are, are symbols of power and technology and development and all of that. All right. So when we think of this, the area, I do want you to think, why is this area so significant? And we already talked about, um, you know, the power and wealth and all of that. Uh, think about how have these cities grown? Well, they've grown with waves and waves of immigrants coming in. Um, the land and water connections are important to get people over, to get products over, to ship things back and forth. It's got proximity to other forms of transportation, so it gets people across the United States. Um, lots and lots of advantages here to see population growth. Let's look at Washington, D.C. This is kind of a fun thing to take a look at. And, <coughs> excuse me, in this area, you the first thing I want you to notice is here we have the Potomac River, and this is the Eastern Branch. Okay, so you have two rivers coming together. Remember, we're in the coastal plain, so it's fairly flat with two rivers. They get quite a bit of rainfall here, so if it tends to flood, this area could flood. In fact, if you've ever heard uh, somebody sarcastically saying that your country's capital was built um, on swampland, well, there might be some truth to it because if these rivers overflow, that's gonna get pretty swampy, okay? Now it's been designed so that, so that wouldn't be a problem. All right, but another thing to notice is look at the streets here. They're a grid pattern. Maybe some of you are very used to a grid pattern. In my little city, we have grid patterns, but if you live in Irvine and places like that, you don't have so many straight lines. You have windy roads with cul-de-sacs and all kinds of things. So anyways, this is a grid pattern. You can see these broad diagonal lines to get you across town quickly. Okay, let me go through how they designed this area. It's pretty fascinating. They hired a man, a designer named Pierre Charles. I don't know how to say this exactly, but La Enfant, I don't know. Okay, and they hired him to design the city. And he came up with these characteristics that he thought would be very significant for the design of the capital of the whole country. He wanted to put all major public buildings on high ground to elevate them in order to show their, their significance. He wanted to sp put spacing in between the government branches and that was to symbolize the separation of powers. Those broad diagonal avenues that we talked about or that I showed you, of course they're to shorten the distance going across town, but also they're named after the states and this is to show importance of our states. Where those diagonal avenues crisscross each other they have formed circles. You know what a circle is? I don't know if any of you have been driven through the city of Orange where it has the circle of orange, but it's kind of like you've come to an intersection and you are kind of forced to drive around it. Okay, and inside the circle, there's usually a green area, a park area, a monument, water, uh, not a, like a water fountain kind of a thing. Okay, so he wanted to create some of those and that slows traffic down a bit and makes you kind of look around. Okay, and he wanted it for parks and monuments. He also wanted a grand promenade and this is significant because it's for public open space. And we're going to find over and over that as cities develop or as they redevelop over time, it's very important to keep public open space. He built a canal in the core area, and this was to stimulate private sector economic development. He wanted to set, side, set aside land for sites for colleges, universities, and for a national cathedral. And this is to express our cultural values of higher education and faith. I can see a typo right there. <laughs> okay, of higher education and faith. 
And then lastly, he wanted to create a monument for George Washington. And the idea is that great leaders deserve recognition. Okay, anyway, so lots of design. Let's take another look at this. There's Washington, DC. And now the next time you visit there, I want you to think about these things we talked about in design, see if you can spot them. All right, I put this in here because look at the population. This was way back in 1790, okay? And look at how big some of the population growth was already getting from back there before 1800. That's just really quite amazing. All right, this is an area, like I said, we think of urban landscapes in this region, okay? And when you talk about urban landscapes, you need to realize there's a lot of spatial interaction. In other words, well, I'm gonna go into each one. So he's, these are the major components. Let's talk a little bit about each one. Spatial interaction here is the idea that people are moving. We're on the move all the time. You might be walking or driving or riding your bike or riding a subway or bus or anything, but we're on the move and we interact with things all over the city. Okay, there's also communication lines, phone lines, all kinds of stuff. And there's also utilities. We don't typically think about utilities, but we need them every single day, right? And so we count on those. And those are some of the major components of spatial interaction. Um, functional complexity is referring to the different ways we use land. Is it for residential areas? Is it for industrial buildings? Is it for commercial buildings? Is it recreational? Is it open space? All those, those kind of things. Um, public services, like we said, that is very significant in any town. And again, it is stuff that we seem to take for granted, but if something happened to it, we would notice in a hurry, right? Even if our trash didn't get picked up for a week, can you imagine? We, we do take it for granted. Or say our water wasn't drinkable for a while and you had to rely on bottled water or you had to boil it every day to use it. Or say our sewer system backed up and it was gonna be out for a couple of weeks. Can you imagine? Oh my gosh. All right, accessibility. Accessibility is important in cities because people have to get around. You have to move from place to place and especially with areas that are this densely populated, you got to think about, you know, there are so many bridges, especially coming in and out of New York City and Manhattan and all of that. Bridges, what if one of those bridges goes down? You've got to have all the other ones that are going to absorb all those people. Okay, so accessibility is really important. And intensity of change. When you go to big cities, you always see them changing things. Okay? <laughs> Big, that's my dog again. Um, you've got buildings that have been quite old now and they need upkeep. So we see things shifting and changing all the time. I like this picture just to show you the idea of the dense population. Look at this, how dense it is here compared to kind of scattered and through here, kind of sparse. I mean, we've got the Rocky Mountains here and the Sierra Nevada Mountains here and so on. All right, let me see if I can finish this up before my dog goes any more crazy. All right, problems in the megalopolis. Yes, when you got that high a population density, there are gonna be issues. Okay, um, there's competition for housing. Um, the rents in these places are astronomical. They're very high. And if you want to have a little garage area or a cover for your car, that's going to cost you about as much as your rent is. It's super expensive. Okay. Uh, and so you're also going to have a mixing of a whole bunch of different ethnicities. And that can be awesome, but it can also cause a lot of tension. Okay. Things, things are overcrowded in a hurry when they're that densely populated. Accessibility, like we talked about, it's kind of hard to get around in places when they're that busy. So there's a lot of different options when you're in cities like subways and busing and that kind of thing. Um, and urban sprawl. So urban sprawl, I'm going to talk about in just a minute when I talk about city design and models. But urban sprawl is say you've got uh, most of your city is right here, but they build out a little bit this little uh, development over here. And now that is sprawled out. And now all the care you were needing for the city, like, oh, services, policing and fire department and waste service and so on, they have to stretch and go all the way out to this part of the city. 
So it puts more pressure on all those services. Okay, and then as sprawl fills in, it's just like we have really sprawled out. You know, like when you're laying on the bed and you're all sprawled out, okay, that's urban sprawl. All right, I'm gonna switch over and talk to you a little bit about uh, models for city development, and uh, I'll see you in a bit. <laughs>